Okay, so the last talk for this session is by uh, Jonas Rigo from ULIC, uh, who will be talking about uh, the ground state of the Anderson impurity model in terms of a recurrent neural network. Please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the organizers to giving me this opportunity. And yeah, today I would like to talk about whether the, whether the Anderson impurity model ground state can be represented as a recurrent neural network. This is a project I'm working on with Markus Schmidt, with Vadim Slav Krinitin. And disclaimer, this is very much work in progress. So because we have not heard it enough today, I will tell you one more time what constitutes um, variational Monte Carlo. So essentially, defining the ground state of a many-body Hamiltonian is a formidably hard task. But luckily, we can formulate it as a variational problem which simply constitutes minimizing the energy expectation value of the Hamiltonian. But usually doing this exactly is intractable. So what we do is we parameterize the wave function in some way such, we, such that we can carry out this minimization problem over some parameters that are much lower dimensional than actually the entire Hilbert space. So in 2017, Kaleo and Troy have, of course, uh, proposed their, in their seminal paper the idea to use, uh, to use neural networks to parameterize the wave function. And that essentially works as follows. So we take a basis state from our Hilbert space, give it to the neural network, and in return it gives us the amplitude of this, the, the wave function amplitude corresponding to this uh, state. So this is what constitutes our neural quantum states, is simply the sum over all of the amplitudes that, give, that, that the neural network gives us. Right. So this idea, as you've heard in the last talks, has gained a lot of traction in the field of quantum many, quantum many body spin problems. In fact, they constitute uh, the best known ground, state, ground states for the J1, J2 Hamiltonian, as the previous speaker actually has taken great part in showing. <laughs> so you can find a lot of uh, people that belong to these names here in the audience, in fact. Um, but the question I want to ask is, what about fermions? So we've heard already today in the first lecture that um, the, the current trend for tackling fermions is to make a first-order approach. So that means we manually anti-symmetrize the wave function, which would exactly mean that we make a sum of an infinite amount, a very large amount of state determinants, which in practice is untractable. So there are very clever tricks like backflow correlations, just factors, and very recently hidden fermions to use only a single Slater determinant and then introduce the inter interactions by means of these tricks right here. Uh, but what about working in second quantization? When in second quantization, there's a work that stands out in particular, and that's by Passetti, a work that um, tried to find the ground state of a um, SYK model, which is, of course, a volume law entanglement state. But, but they found that this cannot be done efficiently. However, this work was then swiftly rebuted by Dennis and company, who showed, well, this can in fact be done. Now, the questions that we are asking is still the same. Can we do, it? Can we do uh, fermionic models in second quantization with uh, NQS? And instead of using something complicated like the SYK, we are looking at a more reasonable model like the Anderson impurity model. And Anderson's impurity model is very special in the way that it has this RG-derived structure, which is very similar to how our current neural network uh, works. And so we pose the question whether recurrent neural networks do indeed present an ideal representation of the ground state wave function of this model. Right, so let me say some words about Anderson's impurity model to those who are not familiar with it. With it, it consists of two major contributions. Essentially, first we have the impurity, which is in the name essentially. Um, it's a very simple single spin full fermionic orbital, but it is interacting, and therefore it can model localization of magnetic moments in matter. And then second, we have um, a C of free fermions in the thermodynamic limit, but it has a special boundary condition because it, because it hybridizes with the impurity, basically changing the boundary condition and introducing these, these density oscillations. Now, if you take these two contributions together, what we get is the condo effect. The condo effect is a highly non-perturbative effect, and it manifests itself in the ground state as a macroscopically large many-body singlet. Essentially, we get this so-called condo, condo screening cloud, where all electrons in the screening cloud participate in magnetic screening of the impurity. 
So because this is non-perturbative, we need a very powerful method to actually solve this model. And canonically, this has been done using the numerical randomization group, and that works roughly as follows. So we take the spectral function, which you can see here, from our non-interacting uh, system, which we can obtain very straightforwardly, and then we perform a logarithmic discretization of the energy domain. Now these intervals that we get from the discretization are then mapped to a semi-infinite chain, the so-called Wilson chain. The crucial property of the Wilson chain is that the hoppings from one side to the next do decrease with the distance from the impurity, meaning that the further down I, may, I, may, I truncate this chain, the smaller the error, and the error is always exponentially small compared to the next correction to the spectrum. Now, the way we actually then go about to solve this model is as follows. We start out with a very small Hamiltonian, diagonalize it. Then we add one more site, diagonalize it again, add a site again, diagonalize it, and so on and so forth. You get the idea. So the point is that we can actually discard high energy states because they don't contribute really to the ground state physics. And that means that the dimension of the Hamiltonian remains constant. And regardless of how long we make this chain, the amount of memory to find the ground state remains constant. It's independent of the length of the chain. Now that's a property that they would like to maintain when we construct our variational ground state approach. Right, now speaking of variational ground state approach, uh, as we've heard, we've heard a lot about different architectures today, and in fact there are a lot. So this list that you can see here is by no means extensive, but it's very important to um, choose this in, with some physical intuition, because after all, there's no free lunch. So the better we choose our network, the better this will work out in the end for us. And the, and the Anderson impurity model is a very specific model with very specific structure. So we can actually formulate some design criteria that a good, that a good network has to satisfy in order, well, in order to be probably a good ansatz. So the first, so the first uh, design criteria is that if we have found optimized parameters for a Anderson impurity model with a Wilson chain of a certain length, then these parameters should be very close to the optimized parameters of any longer Wilson chain, right? So next, the, an optimized wave function for a certain length of the Wilson chain should generalize to shorter and longer Wilson chains. And finally, similar to the numerical normalization group, we ask that the number of parameters of the variational wave function does not increase beyond a certain length of the Wilson chain so that it saturates for a given target precision. All right, so those are our design criteria. So let's go and look at the network that promises to satisfy all of them. And that is the recurrent neural network. Now, why is that? Well, very simple answer, because of the way it processes inputs. It does not ingest it all at once and then gives us an output, but rather it scans it scans the input, and that goes as follows. So we start with the last side of our, of, our, of, our, um, of our state, and we look at the state of the site there, and then we produce a so-called hidden vector, which goes on to, con to, to give us the contribution to the, to the wave function amplitude, but it also gets carried forward, so such that in the next step, we combine the information from the current side with the previous hidden vector, which gives us the new hidden vector, but also the contribution to the wave function amplitude. We do this until the very end, where we get the last contribution to the wave function amplitude, and in the very last step, we get the phase, which is somewhat important. Right, so now that we have our variational wave function at hand, we can actually look at some results and, variate and, um, and validate our design criteria. So first design criteria. What I have done here is essentially plot the length of a Wilson chain for which I found the ground state energy. And here you can see the ground state energy. Now, because this model is exactly so, is, is very precisely solvable, we can compare the energy to the exact energy. And you can see our target precision was something like 5 to the 10 to the minus 5. Now, the way we have carried out this optimization is in an iterative fashion. Essentially, what we've done is we found the first parameters, and then we have used these parameters, once they were optimized, in the for the next longer Wilson chain. In that way, we create a iterative optimization scheme where we always reutilize the optimized parameters from the previous step. And you can see that this actually works very well. And the reason is, very clearly, you can see here, for a length of 31, we can see the ground state energy that is predicted 
by the way, by the way function that has been optimized on length 31 for 41. And this is something like 10 to the minus two, which shows that in fact these parameters that we've optimized for length 31 are, are already really close to the ground state of length 31. So that's, I would say, well, ticks off our first design criteria. Let's look at the second design criteria, the generalization of the wave function. So what you can see here on the y-axis is essentially the length of our Wilson chain on which we have trained the variational wave function. And on the y-axis, you can see the length of the Wilson chain for which we predict the ground state energy, right? So clearly on the, on the Wilson chain length, on which the system has been trained on, the, the, the variation wave function does clearly perform the best, right? So that was obvious, but the very interesting thing is that it also performs really well around in the neighborhood of these Wilson chain lengths. And this again goes to show that the parameters that, have, that are optimal for a certain Wilson chain length are very close to optimal for the next longer, but also previous, the shorter Wilson chain length. But that's the neighborhood. What about the much, much longer Wilson chains? Well, in fact, it, it, it does a fairly good job. It's quite impressive that, um, a le a Wilson, that the model has been trained in a Wilson, length, Wilson chain length of 11 can still give a ground state, a precision of the ground state of 10 to the minus 2 at the length of 51. So with 51 spinful sides down the road, still performs all right. Good. So let's check our last design criteria which is whether or not the number of parameters does saturate with the Wilson chain length. So what you can see here on the left is the number of parameters in our variational wave function. And on the x-axis here, you can see the length of the Wilson chain. Now, here we have the target precisions. Oh, dear God. Oh, here it is. Well, you can see the target precisions of our ground state energy that we want to reach. And let's look at the green curve right here. So the green curve is a target precision of 10 to the minus 4. So at the beginning, like say seven sides, 305 parameters do suffice to find the ground state to this ground state energy to this precision. But when we make it longer, so a larger system clearly requires more parameters. And then we get the last jump to 1377 parameters, but then that's it. It does not grow any further regardless of how long we make the Wilson chain, this, that's the amount of parameters that we need to find the ground state, which is quite neat because essentially now, well, you could just go on making the Wilson chain longer if you do need that for your simulation. Right, now I've talked about uh, these design criteria, so let's look at some actual physical observables. So as I've said before, the ground state is a many-body singlet, right? So we can actually check what it really is in our variational approach by looking at the spin-spin correlator. So this is the impurity spin, and this is the bulk spin of side N. Essentially, because it's a singlet, there's a sum rule that the, that the wave function has to satisfy in order to, be, well, in order to be a singlet, right? So if we sum this correlator up, it, because of SU2 spin symmetry, we can just multiply by three here. All the spin correlators are equivalent. We should get the minus three quarter. Now, we do this for different um, Hamiltonian parameters, and you can see this right here oh, from your perspective. On the right, yes, on the right. And this is, in fact, fairly close to minus three quarters. All right, but let's carry out the more stringent test, and that would be extracting Tk. So the condo temperature is essentially the condo temperature below which we form this, this, the condo singlet. You can see here on the right this very nice plot where we count the ground state degeneracy of the impurity alone. So this is only the impurity, we ignore the bath. And it, it goes here from the local moment, fixed point, where we have um, where the up and down configurations of the impurity are degenerate. It crosses over to log one when now this, the, the impurity is completely screened by the surrounding electrons, and this happens on an energy scale of the condo temperature, which is the universal energy scale in the system. Now, because it's the universal energy scale, basically everything is controlled in the system by the condo temperature, and so also, yes? This is a question. Uh, this? There's, there's a real data in the next slide. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, this is very, I mean, this is very close to to real data, artist's impression. Okay, um, so because this is the universal energy scale, 
basically everything is controlled by it. And so is also the extent, the, 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 the size of the screening cloud. So it's inversely proportional to this condo temperature. That means we can actually extract the condo temperature from the ground state by simply looking how big this uh, screening cloud is. So the way we do this is again looking at the spin-spin correlator and the screening cloud essentially ends where this spin-spin correlator goes to zero. So you can see here on the right, uh, different curves as Marin asked nicely, yes. So you can see here, this is actual, actual numerical curves as obtained from the numerical randomization group where we can compute this. And where it drops, from, and where it drops roughly to 0 0.5, that's, that's where we define the condo temperature. But if we look at, but if we look at this at this scale, because in, the, in, in impurity physics, we can actually draw a one-to-one -one comparison between the length of the Wilson chain and the energy of the system. So we can one-to-one -one compare this. And in fact, where this drops to 0 0.5, roughly as well, we find again the condo temperature. So the data that you can see in blue, this uh, comes from MPS. So this is a very close to exact, I would say. Uh, these are MPS data. And for these values here, our variational our variational um, wave function does a really good job of capturing the condo temperature. So I, unfortunately, I cannot really say that about the top plots for different parameters. It seems to unfortunately break, uh, break down. So our variational approach, sorry, it's blue. The, uh, the, the, the MPS results are orange and the variational wave function is blue. So here it does unfortunately not as good of a job as predicting the condo temperature. But as I've said before, this is very much work in progress and I'm confident that we can iron out these minus issues in due course. Right, and with that, I'm actually at the end of the presentation. Just to reiterate one more time, our record neural network is capable of, of doing the iterative of doing the iterative uh, optimization as we, as we were looking for. It can also generalize to different lengths of the Wilson chain. And finally, the number of required parameter does in fact saturate for at, at a certain point for a certain Wilson chain length, just as we wanted. And then, uh, so look at some outlook. What we really want to do with this is, is to study some um, study some transport phenomena, some non-equilibrium phenomena, and of course go to system configurations that are hitherto on, well, that are hitherto untractable with method, methods like MPS, numerical randomization group, or even um, sophisticated continuous time quantum Monte Carlo, continuous time quantum Monte Carlo approaches. Right, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Jonas. Um, so we have plenty of time for questions. So maybe two questions. Uh, the precision target, that's something you can, you're varying and then it changes the number of parameters accordingly, is that? Yes, indeed. Uh, well, intuitive, intuitively speaking, the more precise I want my wave function to be, the more parameters I need. I think that's a fairly intuitive concept. And so what I do is just set a certain target precision, and then when it's reached with this number of parameters, I call it a day, and it goes on the plot. So then uh, in the last graphs where you were showing this sort of call it a discrepancy between the MPS and NRG. Yes. Um, what was the precision ch target? And as you change it, do you see that they actually get closer? I can already tell you, that, oh dear God, I went in the wrong direction. Um, I can already tell you, yes, they do get closer. However, as of now, we have not gone beyond a precision of 10 to the minus five for the ground state energy. And that seems to not suffice. So unfortunately, I couldn't run any higher precision uh, calculations yet. Very confident that if we just go to higher precisions, this will work out just fine. Uh, yeah, it says here it's five times 10 to the minus five as of now, but if we go preciser, I'm confident that this will just coincide. I wouldn't see why not. Are there any other questions? If not, let's thank Jonas and all the speakers of this morning again. The next session, I think, is at 2 p.m.